something back on my ear. Hey, there you guys are. Well, good morning. You guys could do better than that. Good morning. Okay, very good. Well, we're glad you're here today, spending a little bit of your Sunday with us. Um, as Dan had mentioned, and I think James mentioned also, you know, we're, we're, this, is our, this is Holy Week for us. And so today is Palm Sunday, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Then on uh, Friday, we're going to celebrate, or really not celebrate, but observe uh, Good Friday, and then we will have a big celebration on Sunday, Easter Sunday. So uh, great week, great week, and it's just a time of re reflection for us to be reminded of, you know, who we are in Christ. So let me, guys, let me ask you guys a question. If somebody asked you, hey, who, Eric, who was responsible for the reformation of the church in the early 1500s, what would your answer be? Okay, Martin Luther, would anybody say Calvin? Okay, and how about Wycliffe? Gutenberg, okay, that's, okay, that's, I like that answer, that's good. Um, okay, most of us would agree on Martin Luther. Right, pretty pretty much, we we think of him as the you know the, the the front man for the Reformation. Now let me ask you another question, Bobby. You can't answer because you were here first service. <laughs> Who's heard of Philip Melanchthon? Okay, so good. A couple of us have heard of him. Most people don't know anything about Philip Melanchthon. He was Luther's best friend, right hand man, and um, uh, he had the ability really to temper uh, a boisterous, loud kind of a bull in a china closet, Martin Luther. And um, he was an amazing guy, super, super smart, just spent his entire life dedicated to learning God's word, memorizing scripture. Um, many believe that he was the, the author of how we now look at systematic theology today. So this guy is, uh, is, a, is a big hitter, you know, but he was behind, kind of behind Martin Luther. And again, most people don't know about him. The experts would agree, and they're pretty much unanimous. They're saying that if, if uh, Melanchthon had not come alongside of Martin Luther, the Reformation of the Church may have never happened. Actually, they go as far as saying it wouldn't have happened. So Melanchthon was kind of a behind-the-scenes guy. You know, Martin Luther was receiving the credit and the notoriety of being the leader of the Reformation, kind of that, that bull in a china closet, as I mentioned. Um, Martin Luther is quoted as saying this about Philip Melanchthon. He says, and this is Martin Luther speaking, I am a rough, boisterous, loud, and altogether warlike guy. I, I'm, I'm born to fight innumerable monsters and devils. I remove stumps and thorns and cut the thistles and thorns and clear the wild forest. But my dear friend, Master Philip, comes along softly and gently, sowing and watering with joy with the gifts that God had abundantly blessed him with. And Philip lives by one motto, in the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, charity. So he was the behind-the-scenes guy with Martin Luther, and he was able to kind of rein him in when, when he needed to be reined in. Um, but they needed each other. They really did. Chuck Smith, or excuse me, Chuck Swindoll. Chuck Smith's right over there, if you, in case you were wondering. Chuck Swindoll would classify these two men as the greater and the lesser lights. You have the guy behind the scenes and the front man. Bo both of these guys needed each other. What's interesting is Luther admitted in his quote that he had some rough spots. He had some areas of his life where he struggled and had some sin, and, and Melanchthon was the one who was able to come alongside and hold him accountable and temper him in a godly way. Now, I shared this first service, and it's interesting. I had a few people come up after, um, but, you know, we're all family here, so we can share, right? Um, before I was a believer... Uh, I had a I had a really really foul mouth, and it wasn't just swear words, curse words, that would have been bad enough. But I just had a vulgar mouth, and it was just really, really nasty. Um, there are things that I can still look back on today and think, man, I cannot believe I did or said that. When I became a believer, you know, this was one of the outward signs of my faith was my speaking, and I knew I just needed help with this, and so. Um, I had a couple of friends who were believers. They came alongside me, and they just, you know, Eric, you know, you, you can't say that anymore. You know, you, if you're professing faith in Christ, and it, I wish I could say that I've, you know, conquered that 
that sin completely, but I'm much better than I was. But I, I attribute a couple of my friends to come alongside me and really encourage me. And they were my Melanchthons, okay? They were the guys that came alongside and tempered me. And we all need those. We, we, all, we all need those Melanchthons. Now, you're wondering, why did I even bring that up? Um, as I've studied this book, and, and really in particular chapter 10, I've really come to believe that Ezra, th that we've been studying about these last couple of months, was the Melanchthon of his time. It really was one of the most vulnerable time of the Jews. Um, you know, the Jewish people had over and over, they just made mistakes. They kept making bad decisions, and they were sinning over and over. And uh, Ezra had the courage at this one particular point in, in history to call the Israelites out on their sin and lead the Jewish people to turn from their sin and repent. So we have a lot to cover today. I'm going to pray for the message, and then we're going to jump right in, okay? So let's just bow our heads. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. And, Lord, thank you that we get to celebrate this holy week. Um, Lord, I, I pray for this message today, Lord, that it would um, that it would speak to those. Lord, I, I thank you that I got to learn about this passage, and I, you have chosen me to be your hands and feet to deliver this message today, Lord. But maybe you learn something from this passage today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know about you guys. How many of you are uh, big, like, Ezra fans where you have a big E on your shirt? I mean, all right. I mean, did anybody know a lot about Ezra before we started studying him? I mean, he's, you know, this small little book in the Old Testament. We started learning more about it as Steve Sammons has been leading us through, and we've had James preach and, and Dan as well. Um, but it really wasn't until I started studying for my section of scripture, which is the 10th chapter, the last, you know, the, the last chapter of the book, that I really learned about who Ezra was and, and really the heart of Ezra. And, and the funny thing is we, we really only learn about Ezra. His book is, it's called Ezra, but we don't even, he's not even introduced until chapter seven. So it's interesting. He wrote more than half of his book, that's his name, and he mentions himself in chapter seven. Um, but that's how these Melanchthons are, the people that work behind the scenes. They're okay with it. They work behind the scenes. They're good. You know, we, the credit goes to Nehemiah, who built the, the wall, right? Um, or Moses, the leader, the leader of the Jews, you know, in the Exodus. And Abraham, the father of the Jews. Uh, or John Baptist, you know, we, um, he was the forerunner of Christ. These are the greater lights, the people that, you know, get all the credit. We could actually look at Ezra as kind of uh, the Thomas Jefferson or Ben Franklin of the Bible as we look at our history. Um, he really did some very amazing things. I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, he codified our system. He, he, he did a lot of that. He, he, we, we can look at the book of Ezra and really determine how our roots were developed in our own type of worship. One thing that many don't know is that Ezra was responsible for gathering up a lot of the loose ends of some of the books of the Old Testament and completing them so they could be put into what we now have as the, the Bible. Many believe, and Dan and I were talking about this last week, that, um, that, that Psalm 119, probably the most famous psalm, was written by Ezra. Can't prove it, but really all roads lead to that. Um, by the way, that's a great psalm if you ever want to read a, a long psalm. It's a, it is long, but it is good. Um, and then we're going to see that in, in, you know, as we get into the message here, that in chapter 10, um, Ezra was used to unify the Jews and really turn them from their sinful ways. Really a bold move on his part. And he held the Israelites and their leaders to the standard that God had called them to be. So as we look at the book of Ezra, and I want to just t lead our attention to, thank you for the, um, the one verse. This is what Ezra wrote about himself, but I think it's interesting. He said, For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. And it's true. Ezra was, was a scholar. He really understood the Old Testament. He understood the history of the Jews. Um, what's really interesting is three times the phrase, the hand of the Lord was on him, speaking of Ezra. It's only said once or twice by a few different people in the Bible, but three times by him. So Ezra was really a very, very important instrument used by God. Now, in our time together, we are going to look at kind of the mess that the Israelites have gotten themselves into. And we're going to see how Ezra led them to turning from their sinful ways. And then finally, we're going to try to 
put it all together and come up with, you know, some action items for all of us. So let me just ask a quick question because it, so it helps me understand. If you're a parent or a child in here, just go ahead and raise your hand. I just wanted to see how many people were still listening. Okay, let's pray. We're all done. No, I'm just kidding. Have you guys ever had a situation as a parent I'm talking to now where you're just, you've had it, right? You're with your kids, something's going on, and you just, you're at wit's end, and you just lose it, right? Anybody ever have that? Maybe it's just me. Let me, let me share with you something that happened to us a few years ago. We, we did a long motorhome trip, a three-month trip, which, by the way, is highly recommended. But motorhomes, I mean, you're talking close quarters, you know, five people in, a, in 300 square feet. It's snug. Um, and for the first couple of weeks, you know, we were all trying to get, get, our, get a handle on, you know, the spacing and where, you know, where you're going to put your clothes and your toothbrush and all that. And a lot of bickering going on. But after a couple of weeks, it, you know, it started to get pretty crazy. And, and one particular day, I'm dr we're driving down in the middle of, I don't know, Kansas or something. And one of, one of our kids, I, I won't mention his name, um, but I just had it. I just had it. I guess since I said it was a his, I've narrowed it down. But I just had it. I pulled the motor home over. I put it in park. I stand up and I said, you, in the back now. Kind of looked at me and everybody else looked at me like, what is going on? And I sat him down and I said, we're done. We're not doing this anymore. You know what? Your behavior is sinful. You're being unkind to your siblings. You know, I've had it. We're, we're done. We can't do this for three months. This is, we'll all come home. We, you know, we're, it's going to be bad. And I will say, that was a, a turning point for, for him um, because I think I was able to get him and just kind of grab a hold of him. But I just, you know, uh, I just lost my mind and I, I had, you know, had enough. Now, you're probably saying, that's, that's a great story, Eric. Why in the world are you sharing this? And I really don't know. No, I'm kidding. I am, I am telling you this because this is exactly how God felt towards the Jews in this book of Ezra that we're studying. We have to go back one book, and we have to look at Second Chronicles, the last chapter, and really it basically says God had had enough. That was it. He was done. There was no remedy. The Jews were, you know, just continually making bad decisions and sinning, excuse me, sinning. And God said they had to be punished. So, um, so God allowed the, the Chaldeans or the Babylonians uh, to, to come in and, and, and take over the, the Jews. And it was the darkest days of, the, of the, the Hebrew people. They came in, they tore down the walls, they burned the temple. And then the Babylonians took the Jews uh, captive for 70 years. 70 years. That's three generations. It's a long time. Hopefully they learned their lesson. Um, now, not long after that, about, you know, 70 years later, Babylon eventually falls to Persia. And then the Jews are looked upon with favor again, and King Cyrus allowed them to be released and go back to their, their, their land. So the Lord fulfills his promise by allowing the Jews to go back, and we, we can see this in Jeremiah 29, verses 1 through 10, that 70 years of captivity. Incidentally, you know, we all know, if you know Jeremiah 29, 11, raise your hand. Most everybody does, right? For I know the plans I have for you. That's where this verse comes from. This is, this is what God was saying to the Israelites. Hey, you're our chosen people. We have a hope and a future for you. So they didn't all go at one time. And a, a quick hit, we're going to do a quick history lesson here. Um, they went at three different phases. So the first phase we learned about in 1 through 6, Ezra 1 through 6, led by Zerubbabel. He came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Eighty years later, um, a second group who Ezra led, and we learned about that in chapter 7 of uh, the book of Ezra. Ezra leads a group of people back. They establish the reformation of the temple and then the worshiping of the Jews. And then finally, the third group came 12 years later. Nehemiah led them to build the wall around the city. So before we jump into chapter 10, we have to kind of you know, go back one chapter to understand what was happening in chapter 9. If you were here last week, you remember Steve talked through, Steve Sammons talked through kind of what was happening. I'm just going to highlight a few things. So Ezra was completely distraught. 
right? He ripped his clothes off. He was pulling out his hair and the hair in his beard. I don't know, Rory, uh, that's got to hurt, pulling hair out of our beard. Um, he was just at, at his wit's end. He was very frustrated. You know, these, these Jewish men were marrying foreign wives, pagan wives. And, um, you know, this wasn't an ethnic issue, as we learned last week, but it was an issue of religious practice. So these, these women were sexually impure. They practiced orgies, um, child sacrifices. And then really one of the biggies is they polluted the Davidic line of the Jews. And this is the line that Jesus would eventually be born into. So now grab your Bibles, go to Ezra chapter 10. And we're just going to kind of walk through. We're not going to read each and every um, verse, you know, uh, one by one, because I was only given two hours to preach, and I just feel like I just don't want to waste that kind of time. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so even though we look at chapter 10, this is directed at the Jews. There, there's a lot that we can learn. And and um, if if you don't take anything away from this message today, just hear this loud and clear. This passage is showing us that we need to put God first and take a radical approach to our sins, okay? So we're going to start by looking at Ezra chapter 10, 1 through 4. So I'm just going to read it, and I'm going to kind of break it down, okay? So, so while Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children, gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now, let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you, so take courage and do it. So here's what's happening. As we said, Ezra was beside himself. We know that from chapter 9. Now in chapter 10, now he's outside the temple, and he's laying prostrate, and he's just, you know, the sin of his people has just torn him down to the nub to the point of, again, pulling out his hair and tearing off of his clothes. He can't understand why the Jewish people would be doing this. He's like, guys, aren't we going to learn our lesson here? I mean, can't, can we be done with this now? Um, you know, again, they'd married these pagan women, strange women, they say. Um, some people are actually strange, but, um, but strange in this context means pagan or practicing crazy, crazy things. But the Jews disobeyed God, and they did this anyway. Now, what's interesting is you can see the Holy Spirit through Ezra, and, and I would argue Shechaniah, is opening up the eyes of these men and convicting them of their sin, especially when you go back and look at where he says, there, in spite of everything here, there's hope for Israel. So Shechaniah is proposing that the men that had married these foreign women, strange pagan women, put them away or divorce them. And I, I don't know about you, but, but that seems like a pretty heavy consequence for your sin. That's a, you know, is, man, does the punishment fit the crime here? I don't know. Um, but, you know, they've broken the law and committed sins. And so, you know, yeah, I, it's in the Bible. I think that there's a reason for it. So I don't know about you guys, but I, as I read through this, I'm thinking, wait a minute. You know, is this really happening in the Bible? Is, are they really talking about divorce and divorcing your pagan women in the Bible? So before, you, before we answer that, you have to kind of go back and look at what was happening in the time. So not only were these men marrying pagan women, Many of them had divorced their Jewish women, their, their Jewish spouses, and said, hey, you know, the grass is greener. Okay, we all know the grass is never greener. And in this case, we can prove it. Um, but they had actually divorced their Jewish women, their, their Jewish wives, again, directly in contrast to what it says in Malachi chapter 2, God hates divorce. So he hates divorce, and then he also forbid them to marry pagan women. So these guys were just blowing it all over the place, really. It's pretty, pretty amazing. So in verse 4, we see, yeah, Shechaniah, I, I love this. You know, he's like, hey, Ezra, we stand with you. You know, good luck, man. This is going to be great. We're, you know, we're behind you 100%. Um, 
you know, but this is your baby. You're going to have to be the one taking care of it. Be of good courage. So there's something happening here in this scenario with the Jews that we can very much speak to what's happening today in that, you know, true repentance actually requires action, right? True repentance requires action. Not just saying you're going to do something, but actually doing it. And an action that can actually be seen. So like for me in my prof profane mouth and the nasty comments, that is a, that, that's a real live example of, of how people now, when I went to my 40th anniversary, I know, hard to believe, 40 year reunion at a high school, that's one of the first things people still recognize, man, Minor doesn't throw the F-bomb. I, I, I kind of, I'd like to be known for other things, but, but at least, but I, but I try to share with them why, you know? Um, Anyway, but God expects us to, to separate us from our sins by taking action, not just feeling bad or saying that we're going to change, but actually changing. Now, you'll look up on the screen, um, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, 13 through 16. Peter admonishes us here. Therefore, with, the minds, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he called you to be holy, so be holy in all that you do. Just as it is written, or for it is written, excuse me, be holy because I am holy. So Peter is telling us, you know, we need to be obedient and not conform to our former lusts. Look at the progression. You can see it here. It starts with Jesus. You know, we need to be obedient children. We are then adopted into the family of God. We need to honor and act that way. Then we're on our way to holiness. We are called to be holy in all that we do. And in verse 16, it says that, that um, we shall be holy because I am holy. Not perfection, you guys, right? We're never going to get there. But we just need to be moving on the path of holiness. So I'm going to move on to chapter or verse 5 and 6. I'm not going to read it. But I'm just going to kind of give you a quick highlight of what's happening there. So Ezra stands before, he makes all these leaders, the, the, the leaders, the Levites and the others, to take an oath to divorce their foreign women and repent. But it's interesting, if you notice, if you have your Bibles, you look in, I think it's verse 6, Ezra is still fasting. It's interesting. Why would you be fasting? These guys just took an oath. They're like, yeah, man, we're all in. Well, it doesn't tell us why, but I'm guessing that part of the reason might be that he knows that talk is cheap, and until he sees action, he's going to stay the course of seeking the Lord. So until words become action, they're just words. So, so let me, let's 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 unpack this a moment. So, somebody comes to me and they say, "Gosh, you know, Eric, I'm I'm really struggling with pornography and lust, and I just can't, you know, I can't keep my eyes on my own paper, so to speak, and um, you know, and, and I'm just, but but I'm I'm committed, man. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do whatever it takes. I'm gonna I'm gonna change, and I, I promise you, I'm gonna do that. And I would say, well, let me take a look at the uh, the history in your computer. Oh no no no, <laughs> no, you're not gonna look at the history of my computer because you know that's probably gonna unveil something. So this is talk, no action. Or somebody says, gosh, you know, I'm struggling with drinking, and I just can't get to the other side of it. But you know, I'm I'm committed, and I'm. I, I've taken I've taken precautions and I've put you know safeguards in there and then you walk into islands to grab a sandwich and you see them five margaritas deep at the bar. It's like you know you're t t telling me you wanted to make a change, but but you're not making a change. Or somebody who says, "Gosh, Eric, you know, at the end of the there, there's so much month at the end of the money, right? You've ever heard that? You run out of money before the month ends." And they're like, I just can't get control of my spending. I don't know what it is. I'm trying everything I can. And then you stop by their house and you see 15 Amazon boxes piled up on their front porch. Well, they're just telling, they're just, those are words. Talk is cheap. So we have to be serious. We have to put actions with our words. So when you look at verses 7 through 12, it, it kind of walks through what happened here. And again, I'm not going to... Um, go through each and every verse, but I just want to walk through kind of what's going on here. So, in verse 7, <coughs> you'll notice that it says the Israelites were given three days to, to come back to the city of Jerusalem 
and and uh, with this proclamation. You might ask yourself, wh why three days? Is there something magical about three days? No, I don't think there's anything magical about it. But we do know that these tribes, they were all within about a 50-mile radius of Jerusalem. So three days is a pretty, you know, that's a pretty stout three-day hike, right? So they figured three days, but it prompts them to take action, right? They don't want them to give them a bunch of time to sit and think about it. You know, if it's in a month, they're going to, something else is going to come up and they're, they're not going to go. So three days, they needed to be there. They didn't want people to lollygag or drag their feet. And that's how serious this was. Oh, and by the way, if you didn't respond within the three days, you were exiled from the people of Israel, and they took all of your possessions. Quite motivating to make the three-day trip. So, I know it's hard to believe, but everybody came, right? Three days later, they were all there. So, if we look at verses 9, 10, and 11, let me just tell you what's going on here. They're, they're, it's winter time. So now they just traveled 50 miles in three days. Obviously, the weather was difficult. Now they're there. They're standing out there in, in this huge arena. And, um, you know, it's freezing cold. And, and they, they know what's going on. They're going to be called out on their sin. And so Ezra stands up and he says one thing. He says, you have been unfaithful and had married foreign wives adding to the guilt of Israel. It's like, can you guys not see this? I mean, right? It's like, you guys, you're, you're totally blowing it. So he didn't sugarcoat his words. He just made it real clear. This is what you've done, and this is what you're guilty of. So again, there's this big crowd out, and, and uh, Ezra's kind of calling them out on their sin. I'm, I'm sure it was no fun. Um, but they, they had to stand there in those conditions and kind of hear the gravity of their, of their sin. And they're going to endure some hardship, and we'll see that in just a minute or two. But, but it's really interesting if you if you kind of look through this and you you see you can kind of see the Holy Spirit working here. You know these leaders um, are are going to take drastic action against the, their their and confront their sin. The people in the rain that that you know after three day journey, they're standing out there in the rain, and it's very humiliating to hear like, you guys. You blew it, and we're going to do something about it right now. Um, and Ezra's message, I mean, I, you know, he, just one sentence, pretty clear. You blew it, we're going to fix this. The good news is in chapter, or excuse me, yeah, chapter 10, verse 11, there is a remedy. Ezra provides a remedy here. And so here it is. There's three steps. Number one, you got to confess your sins. You guys have got to own up to your sin. Confess your sins guilt to God. You know, the Apostle Paul tells us that God is faithful and will forgive us uh, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You guys, God does not want to keep accounts of all of our sins. Do you understand that by now, hopefully? Can I get one nod of a head? Okay, good. But if we, if we don't confess our sins, God can't forgive us until we come before him. So we have to take that first action. Our job is to confess our sins, and God's faithfulness will forgive us of those sins. And then the second thing is, is we have to do God's will. Or in the King James Version, it says we need to do his pleasure. So after you're sorry and you ask for forgiveness, we need to line ourselves up with the will of the Father. Last thing is we need to separate ourselves. Now, you know, when you read this, you're like, okay, well, that, we could probably do that. And we need to separate ourselves from all sinners. Hey, good luck on that. Um, how will we do that? If we're going to separate, if we're all sinners, how are we going to separate ourselves? That's not what it's saying here. W what it's saying is, is that we are the light of the world, and we need to surround ourselves with believers and unbelievers. But it means that we want to separate ourselves from the sins of the world. That's what that separation means: sexual immorality, lying, partying, debauchery. You know, you name it, pick your pick your sin. We need to be separated from that. We need to be holy in all of our conduct. So let me ask you a question. H how many how many you know how many glasses of wine is acceptable? Is one glass acceptable? Or is seven acceptable? Okay. Um, 
how long do I have to look at something or someone before it be, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a casual observation and then it becomes a lustful thought, right? Or as first service, I said, how many miles an hour over the speed limit can you go and still not be sinning? And Sam Clarkson just looked at me and he was like this, no. <laughs> no, if you go 66 miles an hour, you're sinning. So I said, really? Wow, okay. So this is not a rules checklist here. This is not a legalistic thing. This is a heart issue. <coughs> we don't want to be legalistic. We need to separate ourselves and put God first, live by faith. Our only hope is really to separate ourselves from the ways of this world and have more of Jesus. Okay, are we good with that? So look at their response. I love this. You're right. We must do as you say. So they recognize the magnitude of their sin and are willing to take drastic action. Now, verses 13 and 14, I'm just going to break these out, just give you a couple of sentences on this. But essentially what was happening was they, they knew this was a big undertaking, and so they knew it was going to take time. But they, and, and they had to be methodical about it. They were having to process a lot of people. So they knew they had to take their time. So now we're at the end of um, verse 14. I guess now we can just, you know, close up the chapter, sing Kumbaya, and everything's great, right? Is that what it says? Or do you look in chapter in verse 15? And you look, there's a couple of holdouts here. We have Jonathan, the son of Ashael, and Jehaziah, the son of Ashael, supported by two Levites, uh, Mesh Meshullam and Shabbatai. They oppose this. So it's not, you know, it's not all perfect here. So we had a handful of guys that just decided, you know, we're not doing this. And a couple of guys that said, yeah, they shouldn't be doing this. So we, we, the text doesn't really tell us why, but we could guess probably on a few of the reasons why maybe, it <coughs> excuse me, they just decided to not check that box and say, I'm not doing that. One is, Maybe they thought the punishment didn't fit the crime. Maybe they thought, you know, this is just this is just too gnarly. This is just too heavy duty. Another option would be maybe they liked it. Maybe they were okay with being in the sin that they were in and they were a okay with the, the, the pagan lifestyle. Or maybe they were protecting themselves or somebody else. The bigger question is why are their names here in the first place? Why are their names here? Why did God choose to name these men specifically? And I wonder if it's because God wants to show us that there are always some people that think they know better than God. Rather than repenting and turning away from their sins, they decided to go do their own thing, do their, go their own way. They're just not putting God first. And I really do believe that that's why their names are listed in the best-selling book of all time, printed in a gazillion languages, and forever we're going to have these guys and their names, and we can point to them and say, they directly disobeyed God. That's not a great place to have your name. In the, in the, you know, if you want your name up in lights, this is not the list to have your name in. So real quick, you go to verses 16 and 17. Again, it just talks through kind of the, the, the method, it was really a, you know, it was, it was a multiple choice, it wasn't even a multiple choice question, it was, are you married to a pagan woman, and are you, if you are, are you willing to divorce her? If the answer is yes, you go to this group, you know, if the answer is no, so that's how they did it. it as near as we can tell, it took about three months to complete. Now, <clears throat> let's sip the water here. As we move on to the remaining part of the chapter, <clears throat> That's what I really want you guys to get a hold of. There are 110, 112 names that are listed. Okay. Um, we're not going to take time to go through all of them because, number one, we just, you know, we all, we have things to do today. It would take a long time, but also I would, pretty sure I'd butcher almost all the names. So we're not going to do that. Here's what we really need to grab from this passage of scripture. There were 20,000 people, 20,000 
people that were processed. There were only 110 or 100, 115 names. So doing some quick math, that's less than one half of 1%. So it's 99.5% of the people did the right thing. So you ask yourself, well, what is the big deal? Out of 20,000 people and 110 or 115 people were the ones who were marrying pagan women, what is the big deal? I mean, I don't know. Am I the only one in the room that thinks that? Or are you guys, okay, well, obviously there was something going on here because that's, God allowed it to be put in the Bible and he listed all the names. Um, so Ezra had, you know, Armelanka of the Bible, he had the courage and conviction to, to, um, to call these men out on their sin. It was a big deal. It was a really big deal for these people to come forward. But here's what I want you guys to do now. Just in your Bibles, if you start in verse 18 and you actually go through verse 22, you're going to notice the priests. And they name a whole bunch of names that are priests, okay? Those mentioned in 18 through 22, the priests would be the equivalent of our pastors and our elders today. These guys were marrying pagan women. They should have known better, but they did it anyway. The Levites that are mentioned in verse 23. They would be the equivalent of a deacon in a church structure. They knew the law. They did it anyway. Then you look at the singers that are mentioned in verse 24 and the gatekeepers in 25. That would be our worship team and our ushers. So these were the leaders of the church. They were engaged in, in this sinful behavior. But their impact around them, they were the leaders. Th their impact was tremendous. So if the leaders of the church and your, your, your group are doing it, don't you think that trickles down? It sure does. So those who were held to a higher standard, you know, they were making a conscious choice to, to put themselves and put their desires first. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that it impacted the rest of the group. So even though the number of offenders was very, very small, the impact was, was significant. And I think that's what broke the heart of Ezra and broke the heart of our Lord. So really, you know, it amplifies how this whole group was poisoned by sin by those of a few. Now, the text does not go into a lot of detail and many of you might be asking yourself, so what happened to those families that were divorced? You know, the women, the pagan women and their kids. This particular passage doesn't really answer that, but you can read and find out that essentially they were, they were, they were taken care of. They were given, they were provided portions. So they were taken care of um, as near as we can tell. So now you look at this list and you're probably thinking, man, what a bummer. My name is listed again forever a list of 110, 115 names and, you know, forever in, in, in the best-selling book of all time, as I mentioned earlier. How many of you think that's a bummer? Okay. I, I, you know, you kind of go, yeah, it's kind of a bummer. It is kind of a bummer, but there's another way of looking at it. As believers, we might want to look at this a different way, and that is that these are men that had the courage, guts, and you know, conviction to step up, take care of their sin, and deal with it. So as a Christian, now you look at the list and you go, hey, right on, man. These guys are kind of some of the, you know, maybe not heroes of our faith, but they're, they're people that actually stepped forward and they, they took responsibility. So let me give you a couple of examples. So let's say you're, you're traveling. Let's say somebody travels here. And they're from some faraway country in a faraway land. And they show up here, they land in Washington, D.C. And uh, as they're walking through the Mall of America, they, they stumble across the Vietnam War Memorial. And they look at this massive wall of names and they go, wow, that's a lot of names. All right, let's move on to the next thing, right? There's no context. They have no knowledge of what the Vietnam War meant, what it means to our country. There's no context. So here we get context. The, this list of offenders gives us context. Or one closer to home would be Manzanar concentration camp. How many of you know about Manzanar concentration camp? Okay, a few of you. 
That's where, at the beginning of World War II, they took all the Jap many of the Japanese families out of their places of business, their homes, and they took them and they sent them to downtown Mojave Desert um, in the middle of literally nowhere. And they built a concentration camp and they, they disrupted all these families. Well, if you're from out of the country and you're traveling up to Mammoth and you see it and you go in and you see the names, you go, wow, that's interesting. Okay. But if you know something about it, it means something. For me, it means a lot. I had, I know four people that were in that concentration camp and I spent a lot of time talking with them about their stories. It was really, really disruptive. So context. So now we look at this list and we go, okay, Eric, I get it, yeah. So many of you might be asking yourself right now, okay, so Eric, this, is, this has been great. Why did you drop a pen? And, um, um, you know, how does this apply to our, how does this apply to us today, marriage and divorce? <clears throat> There's a few things. First, we, we can look at the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14. It's very clear. As Christians, we should not be unequally yoked and marry non-Christians. We got to trust this passage. And that's what was happening with with the Jews of the day, they were unequally yoked. And those pagan marriages tore the Jewish community down. So we do not want to be unequally yoked if, it ever, if at all possible. We don't have time to look at it today, but if you really want to look at a great chapter of scripture about God's view of marriage, look at 1 Corinthians chapter seven. It gives an instruction booklet for marriage. Okay. Now, I might be the only guy in the room here asking this question, but there might be some of you who are asking, okay, so what if I'm married to a non-believer? Has anybody asked that question? Has anybody has that been percolating in anybody's mind, or is it just mine? Okay, so I guess it is just me. No, I'm kidding. I see a few hands. It's a great question. And, and you know, God's word instructs us to stay married to, this, to, to a non-believer, if at all possible. There is nothing in Scripture that says that we should be divorcing a non-believing spouse. There are biblical reasons for divorce, obviously, but them not being a believer is one of them. And there's a few reasons. Number one, many of us became believers after we were married, married, right? And our spouse maybe isn't a believer yet, right? Maybe God isn't finished with them or our kids. We want to be able to share the love of Christ and be the salt and light. So there are very good reasons. Again, there are biblical reasons for divorce, but uh, having a, a non-believer as a spouse is not one of them. We are commanded to be salt and light in all of our relationships. So at the risk of beating the dead horse, which, by the way, is one of my signature strengths, I want to make sure that we all agree on one thing, and that is this. This passage does not tell us in any way, shape, or form to go and divorce our non-believing spouse. Can I get an amen or an agreement? Or Okay, we're clear on that. I don't want somebody coming up and saying, so, uh, exactly, no. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's what the passage is saying. It's so clear. If there is something in our lives that separate us, or get in our way of giving God and Jesus their rightful place in our lives, we need to examine it, and we need to work towards getting rid of it. In the case of the Jews, it was marrying pagan women. In the case of some of us here, it's anger, it's greed, it's selfishness, it's lust, it's fill in the blank. But we need to identify what it is, and we need to get radical about handling it. So in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, thank you, sir. You know, in, in, this is Jesus' uh, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about exactly what he how we, he wants us to look at our sin. If our eye causes us to sin, we need to gouge it out. If our hand causes us to sin, we need to lop it off. Now I'm pretty sure that that does not mean that God wants us to walk around with one eye and one hand sharing the good news because 
that's not a really good sales pitch at all. I'll just tell you right now. But that's the kind of, that is the kind of approach that we need to take towards our sin. So what are our takeaways from this, this morning's message? A couple of things. Ezra, I, I just, the more I read about him, the more I just appreciate and admire him. Our Melanchthon of the Bible, you know, really one of the unsung heroes of the Old Testament and, and, and the Bible, arguably. He preserved the Davidic line of the Jews and the remnants returned, the Jewish remnants returned to the promised land. He had the courage to call out the Jewish people on their sin and lead them on a path of repentance. We need to separate ourselves, again, not just physically, but we need to, by our thoughts and actions, we need to be set apart. We're not going to be perfect, but we just need to strive for holiness. If we are currently unequally yoked in a relationship, pray about how you can love the other person and demonstrate the love of Christ to them. For you young people here today that are young, mar not married yet, um, please trust this passage. You know, do not be unequally yoked. Um, it's really important. This makes, you know, marriage is hard, and it's a lot harder if you're unequally yoked. Finally, if you're here today and you're stuck in repetitive habitual sin, I would urge you to get right with the Lord. Confess your sins. We're not going to ask you to stand up or raise your hand or anything, but just in the quietness of your heart, if there's something going on that you need to get right with God, you do it today. Today is the day. We have to get real. God will help us. He is faithful and he will help us. So I'm going to ask the band to come forward. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we are, Palm Sunday. Who can tell me what Palm Sunday is? Not all at once. Come on now. What it say it? Right. It's Jesus' triumphal entrance into the city, right? They take palm fronds. They're laying it down. Why did they do that? They didn't want, they, it was so holy that they didn't want him to touch dirt. So today's Palm Sunday. That's what we're celebrating. Next Friday, this coming Friday, rather, we will observe Good Friday. And then on Sunday, we get to celebrate Easter, which is the best day of the whole year. So, Here's what I really am asking you to do today. I want you to reflect on what God through Christ has done for us. And Bobby and I were talking about this just after the first service, and it, it really it really hit me hard again. And that is that, you know, for the Jews, they had to divorce their pagan women. For us, maybe it's, you know, really working on some sins. But God's approach to sin was a little more radical. Um, he allowed his son, his only son, to be beaten, crucified, and killed to pay for the sins of all mankind. That is how serious our sin is. That God would allow his only son to go through what he did for you and for me. Our sins have separated us from having a relationship with God, but through Christ and his blood, those who believe, have a relationship with God and will have everlasting life. Now, if you're here today and you're not exactly sure where you are in your walk, if you've never made the commitment to follow the Lord or you're struggling or whatever, you know what? Don't let this day go by without having somebody up here praying for you. We would love to talk with you and walk you through this. And if, you ha if you're wondering what it means to be a believer, we'd love to talk with you about that too. So let me just pray for us and we'll let the band take us home with the song here. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity to share today, Lord, and thank you for your word. Really, Lord, and for the simplicity of, of the word of how we need to deal with our sins. So, Lord, as we go out today, I pray that, um, Lord, we would all look at our sin in a different way and how you paid such an unbelievable price uh, to cover our sins, Lord. And so we love you, God, and we thank you, and we look forward to celebrating Easter this coming Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.